Good morning. This is the moment. I am so delighted to get to talk this morning in the series about 2012, whether or not this is the year that the world ends. Or whether, in fact, this is the year of a great transformation. And there seems to be two schools of thought with this whole Mayan calendar thing. Somebody see, some people see that as a sign that on December 21st, boom, and <coughs> it's over. And there are other people who interpret that exact same information that in fact this is the year for human evolution to rise in consciousness. And so I thought it would be helpful, within the context of transformation, that we could talk about the individual transformations that we have already gone through, may be going through, or may have yet to face. And so I wanted to start with reading the Bible verse from Matthew, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. And it says, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, the heavens opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming onto him. And a voice from the heavens said, this is my one dear son. In him I take great delight. Wouldn't it be awesome to get a sign that's that clear? Have you ever had those moments when you just sort of want to look up at the sky and say, God, I need a sign. Not one of those kind of muddled, I have to interpret it kind of signs. If you could give me like the dove sitting on my shoulder kind of sign. And others of you may have experienced other kinds of signs. Like those signs when you're just walking down the road and suddenly a bird swoops down. And most likely it is not a dove. <laughs> and you get some bird poop on your head. Now people might consider that to be a sign. Not a good sign. <laughs> but I was interested to find out that in China, in the Chinese culture, if a bird poops on your head, that is awesome. <laughs> they start to smile and laugh because they say that is a sign of opportunity, that you're going to come into some great wealth. Oh, happy day, a bird pooped on my head. <laughs> And, as some of you know, around here in the plaza, we have been having a bit of a crow problem. And there has been crow poop everywhere. Now, apparently, crow poop is even better. <laughs> like, it's in the range of birds, it's the highest poop that you can have on your head. <laughs> So if you're out and about this week and you get that crow signal, just think, oh, happy day. <laughs> so it seems that there are signs all around us and that we get to choose how we interpret them. So some of you may be thinking that this is the year when the world ceases to exist. So maybe we should spend the next 11 months partying like it's 1999. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, that was Y2K. That didn't happen. So you decide. You can party like it's 1999, or you could spend this year seeing it as a way to raise yourself up to a higher level of consciousness. And so I've often heard it said, well, everything happens for a reason. But what if 
everything happens and we choose what reason we give it. Each of you, I'm sure, and right now, think about those pivotal moments in your life, those moments when something dramatically changed in triumph or tragedy. Think about what those pivotal moments have been in your own life and what caused them to seem so defining. When I think about transformation, I often think about Myrtle Fillmore, who is one of the co-founders of Unity. And it is a wonderful story. Back in the 1880s, Myrtle had been raised to think that she was sickly and weak and had no power. And so she began to read some new information called New Thought that started her to maybe have an inkling that there was another way of being. And so she read and she studied and she had this passion for finding out more about this idea that each person could find the strength within them to have a spiritual experience and to actually heal themselves. And so one day she went to a lecture by a man named E.B. Weeks and I'm sure the man said many, many things. But Myrtle walked out of the lecture and remembered only one. And that was, she had a thought. I am a child of God, therefore I do not inherit illness. And that one thought just completely rocked her world because it was so different than she had thought about herself in all the years adding up to that moment. And so Myrtle went out after having that thought, and she committed to every hour on the hour, forgiving herself and asking her body for forgiveness for not believing in it. On the hour, every hour, every day, every week, every month for two years continuing to do it when it hadn't shown up yet, when she couldn't see it or she couldn't sense it, but she still had enough faith in that it might be possible to keep persevering for a period of two years. And in fact, she was transformed. So if you look at what happened in Myrtle's life, you might say that that moment when she heard E.B. Weeks was a defining moment in her life. But I would offer that that moment would have had absolutely no value if she had not been prepared to hear it by the study and the practice that she had done beforehand, and if she had not gone home and practiced and practiced and persevered. If she had gone home and lived her life in exactly the same way she had before she heard that phrase, we all would not be sitting here in this building in this moment. So it turns out that defining moments are not necessarily about that pivotal thing that happens in your life that dramatically changes the way you see things, but it's also about the preparation of what you do before and the hard work that you do after. And I thought about this when I was growing up in Texas. We would often talk about we were fixing to get ready to do something. My daddy would say, Wanda, I'm fixing to get ready to the store. Tell me what you need so I'll be ready. So it seems like this fixing to get ready thing is part of the secret of making these defining moments meaningful. We fix to get ready by preparing ourselves, by working and acknowledging that strength and power within us. And then we do the hard work afterwards of staying with it, even so, though sometimes it might, we might have doubts 
it might be difficult. There might be things that are unknown. There was a great book that some of you may have read, um, written by Malcolm Gladwell, and it was entitled Outliers, The Story of Success. And what he did is he went through and he researched many diverse people, from the Beatles to Bill Gates, about what was it that successful people were doing that were causing them to have such great success in their life. And what he found was a common thread throughout. He found that they had a passion for something specific, and they had the ability to persist in the face of obstacles. Now imagine that you're the Beatles, and it's August of 1960. In August of 1960, the Beatles manager had gotten them a gig in Hamburg, Germany. Eh, they'd been playing some clubs in Liverpool, nothing big, just kind of hanging out. So they were ready to do this gig in Hamburg, and they actually loaded everybody up in a minivan. The manager, his wife, her brother, and the Beatles all got in a minivan and went to Hamburg, Germany. And what they found when they got there was that the gig that they had gotten was to play eight-hour sets seven days a week for $5 per person. $5 for the whole eight hours of playing. So you can imagine, if you're a Beatle, that you get to Hamburg and you're thinking, do I stay or do I go? <laughs> you might even been thinking before you even left, I don't know what this Hamburg thing is about. There might have been fear and anxiety or concern or frustration that they might have felt before they even left Liverpool. But something inside them made them love music. And so they decided to stay. It was miserable. It was a struggle. It was not an easy gig. But instead of leaving in the middle, they actually stayed for over two years and did the hard work and came back to England better musicians. In fact, John Lennon later said that those two years in Hamburg was the point at which he became a songwriter. And so if you look at somebody completely different, like Bill Gates, as far as I know, he has no musical talent whatsoever. And when Bill was in middle school, the Mother's Club spent all their bake sale money on buying some time on a computer so that the kids could learn how to do this newfangled thing called programming. You know, this was in the olden days. They didn't have computers that you sat on your desk. They had a terminal, and it hooked up to some big computer that sat in a room someplace else. But Bill Gates said he was fascinated by this machine. He would go on his off hours whenever he had time, up till 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, programming over and over and over again because he felt so passionate about what he was doing. And he ended up finding like-minded friends that were just as passionate and persistent as he was. And interesting enough, in middle school, he found a guy named Paul Allen, who he shared this passion with, who ended up later to go on to help him co-found Microsoft. And this is what ended up making Bill Gates an expert. You might have said that it was a defining moment when the Mother's Club paid the money to let them have time on the computer. But in fact, it was his passion and his persistence that enabled him to succeed. And so what we find from all these stories 
from Myrtle, the Beatles, and Bill Gates, I can bring a correlation between these three diverse people. They all had a passion for some specific skill. They were all fixing to get ready. And they were willing to do the hard work, even when obstacles arose. And so what um, Malcolm Gladwell found out is he sort of has this theory of 10,000 hours, that if you want to succeed in something, you need to devote 10,000 hours to get it right, to be an expert, to succeed in whatever it is you might cho choose. And the other thing he found out that was an important element was failure. That it turns out that failing is one of the very best teachers that we can have. If you are simply trying not to fail, then you most probably will not succeed. Because the willingness to go through and try things that may not work and to learn from those experiences, as I'm sure each of us can think of times in our lives when we feel like we completely failed, and yet think about how much you learned from that experience. So if we go back to Jesus and that moment that he was baptized, if Jesus had gone home and just watched reruns of Two and a Half Men or How I Met Your Mother. Oh, wait a minute, they didn't have TVs back then. Okay, whatever Jesus did to goof off in 2,000 years ago, we probably would not be talking about that baptism today because it was the fact that he was willing to go out and teach others and wish to be of service to others, to encourage and support others, that's what made that baptism a pivotal moment. And so I wanted to end with a friend who I think is a role model of this idea that we can fix to get ready, take on whatever life has to give us, and then do the hard work to make it happen. And I want to share a little bit about Daniel Stoner, who was just up here talking about the AIDS walk. Daniel had a stroke in late 2010, and the left side of his body was paralyzed. So some might think of that as a pretty darn defining moment. But what I love about Daniel is that he decided that he wasn't going to make his life about having a stroke, that it wasn't going to be about the grief and sorrow for all the things that he had given up in his life, that it wasn't going to be about the obstacles and the challenges that he was going to face, that his life was going to be about the optimism and courage, minute by minute, even moment by moment, in rehab for minutes, hours, days, months, and over a year, on multiple surgeries, on all the things that happened in his life that some might have considered obstacles that could not have been overcome. And Daniel decided that he had the passion and the persistence to make it happen. And the other thing I know about Daniel is that before the stroke happened, he had been fixing to get ready to face whatever life would throw at him for many years before. He had been working his spiritual path and making sure that he was right with himself. And he had been of service and encouraging others before the stroke ever happened. And so that's a critical component of what ended up making that a pivotal moment. And as I look out on you guys, you all are role models. I can think of Bob and Shannon and Phil, and all of you that have had times in your life when you faced crises, and you've been willing to do the hard work and make the effort. So perhaps this year of transformation can be the year that we decide that we are going to encourage and support ourselves 
and each other to rise to a higher level of consciousness, to find that thing that we are most passionate about, and to persist in the face of all obstacles. And so that we can look back and say, yes, this was a defining moment. So let's take those thoughts into meditation. <laughs> 